Today's video is sponsored by Guildman's Guide to Speed, an arcane punk source book for infusing speed excitement into your 5e games. Greetings adventurers, I'm back at the Twisted Pint Tavern and this time I'm actually here to read stories about Am I the A-Hole and we'll give our thoughts to determine if they were or were not. Hello again Luke Goblin, thank you for having me back in, I'm excited to read some of these stories. Alright, starting off for today, we have Am I the A-Hole for not letting my players have a war machine the size of a Tarrasque? I'm a fairly experienced dungeon master who just recently realized that I was that guy and I've been desperately trying to become a better DM for my group. On to the actual story. I recently let my players have a mobile base of operations. I like to give my players a place that they can feel like home, but I don't want to keep them from wanting to explore the world. The base is huge size and it was very difficult to get moving, but after a lot of work and grinding they were able to get the thing going. The problem, one of my players was bragging in the discord channel about how he was going to use enlarge slash reduce on the talus to make it gargantuan instead of huge. I went into a panic spiral and had no idea what to do. The old me would have just killed the player's character with a bolt of lightning and be done with it, but I really don't want to be that person anymore. I was literally crying because I had finally started running a game my players were enjoying, but I felt like if they got something that OP, the game wouldn't be fun anymore. So I added a homebrew rule that enlarge slash reduce wouldn't work on something of large or bigger size, mostly so they couldn't just run over every encounter. My players were actually very understanding, and I don't think I did anything wrong, but I'm still worried. Am I the a-hole? So the first thing that I want to address is the fact that he acknowledges that he used to be that DM, like saying that he would just kill the player's character outright for an idea like this. I want to acknowledge that he said he used to be like that and he's not anymore. So that already is like, I guess, points for the guy, like credit that he's trying to do well. And that's why he's worried is he doesn't want it to come across like he's actually being the a-hole DM. Yeah, I think the answer here is that he used to be. He was very much so the rocks falls, everybody dies kind of guy. Yeah. But I do understand that balance wise, especially as a new or inexperienced DM, sometimes when someone throws an obstacle your way, the first thing you do want to do is just completely axe it. Now, I think the homebrew rule, especially talking it over with them and making sure it's OK, is a great way to resolve this issue. Yeah, I've I mean, I've had moments in my games, too, where you have to make rules like, no, a spell doesn't work in this way even though it says it should even though it feels like it should but you know tell the players hey guys i don't want to let this happen because it will absolutely demolish everything else moving forward and so just for fairness and plot's sake let's not do this like that i don't feel like that's an a-hole dm move i feel like if you're you know axing every cool thing that the players always want to do and you only let things run specifically by the book only when it's convenient for you then that's running into some sketchy territory. But just saying, hey, I don't want to give you a gargantuan mecha Godzilla to just trample everything with. I don't think that's an a-hole thing to do. And I like that his solution isn't to try to double down and do the things a player wants to do, but even more broken. I think that's another mistake DMs can fall into where they're like, you know, your gimmick's pissing me off, so I'm gonna do so I'm gonna do your gimmick back, but twice as like BS. So, I mean, I think overall he's uh, pretty reformed in terms of a that guy DM. I will say, though, like if the players did do it and he allowed it and he wanted to let it run for a couple encounters and then he did have the enemies come back in with their own, again, like Mecha Godzilla style thing that was just as powerful or maybe even a little bit more just for plot reasons. So they had this giant Mecha Kaiju fight that could be really cool, but it would have to be done very, very carefully. So it didn't feel like he was just saying, uh, no, you Uno reverse card, screw your idea. Yeah, no, definitely. And then maybe they can have like the local government ban that spell after the Mecha yeah. Kaiju battle, you know, the the king comes down and he's like, all right, look, here's the deal. You have your giant Tarask sized base. I don't like that. It's destroying my forests. It's ruining villages. Please keep it regular sized. And then we have our lore friendly reason why they can't repeat that habit after giving them like a great send off. Yeah, honestly, I my rating, my thought on this is not the a-hole. He's especially since he's trying to be so cautious about it. And he talked to the party about this and, and kind of I'm assuming at least with how he talked about it, how and why he does, he doesn't want that to go through. So I don't think he's the a-hole here. Am I the a-hole for refusing to run my game after getting outvoted? 
Hi, I'll be fast. I've been running a D&D game for the last four years. Last session, one of my players abruptly attempted to kill an NPC during peaceful negotiations. They teleport away after the PC fails to kill them. Then the PCs escape. The city, full of the BBEG's military after a successful war, are now killing them on sight. This means they can't complete any of the quests I spent the last four months writing. Quests that would have helped them assemble a fighting force to take on the BBEG. I wanted to retcon it, because I have four months of effort dropped into these quests. I want to salvage all the cool plot lines I have. It's my source of fun for the game. However, if I did that on my own, it would be a mirror of the murder hobo behavior that got us here. So I put it to the vote. I'm outvoted, as one player abstains. I have zero motivation to run a game for these people anymore, as I even expressed how frustrated I felt and I've been completely ignored. So am I the a-hole for wanting to pick up toys and go home? So initial thoughts, similar to the story at the beginning, he does talk to the players, except for this time it's interesting because he feels completely ignored. So I understand, especially as a DM who sets up sometimes political intrigue style campaigns, that you want to build up to a point. But murder hobo tendencies sometimes can put a wrench in that. And now you can take like a five step plan and it's just completely ruined. But it's really how he handles it next that determines if he's the a-hole, I think. Yeah, I, I could see both sides of it. This one's a little tougher because, like he said, he's been running the game for four years. He's got four months of effort planning these future quests. So you don't want to just scrap that. But at the same time, player agency has a big factor in these games. And if you take that away or if you say, well, actually, that didn't happen, that kind of removes the impact that the players feel like they have on the game at the table. So I understand the frustration. I understand not wanting to let all that go to waste. But that's also why you need to be so careful planning that much out in advance, because the fact is, you're not writing a book, you're running a game for people, and even if they decide to go off and murder hobo everything, that's something that can happen, and it can completely derail your four months of planning. So don't put that much time into something that you expect it to go a very specific way, and if it doesn't, it ruins everything. And just to add a little context, it looks like an edit comes in later, and they say that the quest they were doing, they were negotiating a workers' union for a bunch of blacksmiths who got their wages cut like as the Civil War ended in this setting. And then if they succeeded, they're going to get this small army of blacksmiths basically making weapons for the resistance, you know, that the big bad evil guy was occupying. So it seems like they definitely had a lot of like steps there where they just made assumptions and that fell flat. Yeah, and again, the the whole peaceful negotiation and everything, like, I, I get it, and you might want to assume that the party's going to cooperate with that, but there's nothing wrong with saying out of game, hey guys, I, I know that this might feel a little railroady for a moment, but let's get through this without killing everything, please. Like, you want to try to avoid telling the players what to do, absolutely. But if you have so much writing on a very specific plot point, you can either out of game or even in game stress the importance of this needs to go off properly. And if it doesn't, and if the players don't cooperate, then it's the whole consequences of their actions thing. And sometimes you end up dropping four months of effort, but you can always try to key that in somewhere else as much as possible. Yeah. So it's... It, it's just hard because, you know, I, I get where the DM's coming from, but I also feel like he was with four months of hard set plans, very much running a railroady game. And this is where I just as a general like world building advice, you always want to build almost a little bit of a theme park that creates like an illusion of choice as much as people hate that term. So if you have a resistance you're trying to build and the blacksmiths are vital, you can tell the party that, hey, there's like two or three different groups that would help you. And if they pick any of the other two groups, eventually someone in that faction is going to key them in and say, we really need the blacksmith's help. We don't have enough weapons. You know, we're fighting the streets and they're just out geared. We need some kind of help. So there's always a way to kind of nudge them back in that direction. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Absolutely. The illusion of choice is something that us as dungeon masters want to try to make sure our players don't feel like that's what's going on. But sometimes that's what's going on. You need to make it to where... Regardless of which path you choose, they end up joining at the same place again, because otherwise you risk ruining all of your other plans. 
So, what do you think? Is this guy the a-hole? Uh, I think he's just frustrated right now. So if he picks up his toys and leaves and doesn't at least try a session or two of like nudging the party towards. And from my understanding, this would be nudging the party towards even something they want to do. They just kind of, you know, botch this one session. He definitely would be the a-hole if he just like picked up and left now. Yeah, I agree. It kind of depends on how he proceeds at this point, because the thing is, like he said, he put it to a vote and he was outvoted. So if he just ignores the vote again he's completely taking away the player agency and that that's a that's an a-hole thing to do as a dm but i again don't want to say that the guy is just completely in the wrong so yeah i i get that he doesn't want to scrap all of his planning that's totally not an a-hole feeling of not wanting to scrap four months of work but if you just pick up and go because you've been outvoted it just kind of gives that tantrum kind of feeling so this third one is a would I be the a-hole, so it hasn't quite happened yet. Would I be the a-hole if I abandoned my D&D group knowing that it hurt my DM's intention to start a podcast? I guess this is a little niche, but anyone who plays tabletop RPGs should be able to level with me. I love my D&D group, and I especially love playing with my dungeon master. I've never played with anyone so inventive, invested, creative, and keen with improv. He's incredibly talented. Some of the players on the other hand, can be frustrating at times. Always fun, but sometimes frustrating. They don't seem to care about anything happening if it doesn't directly affect their character, and will often walk off to do other things around the apartment if they're not being directly spoken to. Instead of starting small and aspiring to greatness, they tend to insist on being badass, brooding demigods from the start, often ones that don't even seem to want company or have no investment in their party. This has all been fine, I can still have fun even if their methods aren't the same as my own. The only thing that sort of makes it a problem is what's come up recently. My DM wants to take our campaign and start a podcast. It makes sense, his world is extremely fleshed out and lively. He's charismatic and his stories are always packed with action, colorful NPCs, and twists that keep his narrative fresh. He's also got stellar recording equipment and knows how to piece things like this together. But listening to players that refuse to invest in other party members makes terrible radio. Listening to the characters that don't want to grow up, but would prefer to be badass and invulnerable from the start, is also terrible radio. Anytime I bring this up, my friends get defensive and I feel like a dick. So I could just walk, it feels like an exhausting venture, putting in all this effort for something that I feel won't have the legs to run because of a playstyle that's more or less fine at home, but bad for listeners. But my DM has made it clear that since I do want to start my character small and aspire to something bigger through character growth, he's been particularly excited for me to be a part of this and has been writing a lot of stuff for me. I feel like I'd be leaving him out to dry. Would I be the a-hole if I said F it and let him figure it out on his own? Or should I stick it out and try to make this party work? So I, I, I see both sides on this one because the person like the not wanting to be a part of a podcast and everything like first off that's a personal choice every single person every player at the table has the right to say i don't want to do that and their reasons for not wanting to do it are because they don't think the podcast would carry much you know weight and character with everyone just being kind of problem players at least to them so on that side of it, you know, I, I don't think they're an a-hole at all. If they want to just not be a part of the podcast, that's totally their decision. However, if the DM has been really, really excited for this and the player hasn't really like put a stop to it early on and they let things get to this point, then it is kind of a dick thing to do to just be like, hey, this thing that you're really excited for and uh, kind of hinges on me being here. Sorry, bud. I'm out. Yeah, the thing that kind of like jumps into my mind immediately is it seems like he is almost open to the idea um, in the sense that he thinks the DM's good. The DM actually really likes him, so they both have like a mutual respect. He just feels like it's not a good fit for the party. Maybe the solution is as simple as they have their fun sessions and then maybe the DM works hard to find a more serious group for this podcast, assuming that, you know, the OP here actually wants to be part of it. Because I'm getting the vibe that he feels like the audience is going to suffer for it uh, more so than that he, you know, resents the players as problem players. And I, too, you know, I wouldn't want to spend like four to five hours a week, especially if I'm doing prep time with the DM ahead of time to make a really good show. And then a bunch of people come in, phone it in, and there's like no viewership. The views really aren't going to reflect it if this plays out as the person presented it. 
Yeah, I think another way that this could be handled uh, is if the player and the DM were to talk to the other players and they said that they've brought it up a couple times, you know, and they the players get defensive and such. If they just talk to the other players and say, hey, guys, this is going to be the podcast etiquette. If we are going to do this podcast, if everyone's excited for it, I need you to stay at the table. I need you to be engaged and we need to make this entertaining radio. As they've been saying, things aren't entertaining radio. They need to make sure that it is entertaining radio and then do a couple test sessions. I mean, if you're planning on starting a podcast of your game, you're probably not on a super hardcore time crunch because there's other podcasts of games. It's not like you you need to try to beat other people out to it. So what I would say in this case is talk about the etiquette with the other players, do a couple sessions that are recorded like you're going to make it the podcast and then go through and see how they turn out. And if the players understanding the etiquette and understanding the stakes here are able to turn it around and make it entertaining, then you go for it. But if after those couple episodes, it's just not happening, that's when you tell the DM, look, man, I'm really sorry, but I'm just not comfortable being a part of this if they're going to continue to be like this. I feel like that's a way you could handle it that settles both sides. I think this leans into a little bit of the Matt Mercer effect and critical role in the sense that a lot of them, if they're thinking of starting a podcast, they definitely have watched other podcasts. And maybe the players are defensive because they watch, you know, a show like Dimension 20, a show like Critical Role. And they're like, yeah, no, we're we're as good as that. And, you know, clearly they aren't. And it's really not that surprising they aren't. It's really nothing against them. They probably don't have, you know, 10 years of improv and professional voice acting capabilities and have been playing the system, you know, since they were five. So they're not going to be that caliber. I think everyone thinks that, you know, oh, I'll make it, you know, like we'll be the podcast that takes off. So I definitely get why he's getting pushed back. Like people are being defensive. It's very normal for like anything. And the barrier to entry for a podcast in theory is nothing, but to have, you know, a bunch of viewers watch it is a completely different threshold. So really, it does come down to how long has he really tried to hash it out? You know, has he been honest with them? Has he been kind to approach it too? where it's like, hey, you know, your character, like you were saying, he walks off. Your character doesn't really role play or like take leads from other people when they're giving them cues. We're going to have to tighten this up. We're going to have to do a test run just to really make sure that this is something that we're proud of putting out because, you know, what we do normally, it's fun. We'll have stories about it later, but it's definitely not podcast ready. Yeah. If you're going to have your name tied to something, I mean, even if it's just as simple as a for fun D&D podcast, you want to make sure that it's it's good. And I don't think leaving the group because of that concern itself is a problematic thing. It's going to suck, but I don't think it's a problematic thing. But I do want to point out here that this uh, post on Reddit actually has a tag on it uh, saying that people determined that this person was the a-hole. Yeah, which is really surprising because it is one of those things that if he just talks to the DM and says, hey, I really I don't have the time for this. I don't really want to do this. If the DM's going to be like, new rule, if you're in my games, I'm streaming it, and anyone that leaves is the a-hole, it kind of feels weird, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I feel like I get you don't want to have to run like a dozen games, and, and some of them are podcast games and some of them aren't, but really I feel like for the most part you should do that. You always want to have something that's on the air and off the air, because if people, especially these kinds of players, have problematic tendencies but they can quell them for the podcast they're still gonna want that relaxed fun game where they can just be themselves without feeling like there's these rules so i feel like in this instance especially where they're coming into a game that's already running i get like that's how the first uh season of critical role started but you'd probably be better to just make a new game for the podcast anyway. And at that point, if the person said, hey, I really don't want to be a part of this, they're not leaving a group that's already halfway through a campaign. They're just not joining the new one. And I don't think that that's at all a problem. That's totally up to them. And I think uh, maybe the reason he got this tag is simply because the language here is like, it's honest, but maybe it comes off a little harsh if he said it verbatim to the party. I don't think he went up to the party and said, hey, guys, this is unwatchable. None of you know how to role play. This is going to be the worst podcast ever. I don't think he walked out like that. I really don't think it's weird if any player was told, hey, this is becoming a podcast. Are you coming next session? 
and they say no. Yeah, no, absolutely. I I don't think this person's the a hole unless they handled it very poorly w- with the rest of the group. You know, like you said, with how it's written, it could it could come off that they were a little bit abrasive about it. And like with most things, the subject doesn't necessarily make you the a hole. It's how you handle it. So with this writing here, if they were abrasive, if they let the DM, you know, let them on for who knows how long saying yeah i'd love to do it yeah i'd love to do it and then right before the first session starts of the podcast they drop out that's not the best thing to do but it's hard to say someone's an a-hole for exercising free will you don't want to be part of the next critical role i mean i would love to be part of the next critical role uh but i also understand if someone doesn't want to be part of the next critical role Sometimes I just want to play with my friends and not feel like I'm on camera. Even when my friends are streaming on Twitch, you know, playing a game, sometimes you don't want to be in the Discord call with them because it just feels weird. And restrictive sometimes, too. I mean, not that I'm saying either of us are problematic players or anything like that, but when you're streaming, when you're recording, there are certain rules, certain things you do, don't do, say, don't say, and certain people have issues with those rules being in place all the time yeah and it can be as simple as like you know sometimes like maybe you don't want to use your real names and someone accidentally calls you your real name or they're talking about like a party or the college that you go to and if it was a normal situation it'd be completely fine to bring it up but now that you're streaming you don't want to like dox the person and it feels like you're restricted for no reason yeah i agree i don't think this person's the a-hole i think they could be the a-hole depending on how how they've handled it so far and how they proceed And I agree with you on this one. I'm just really surprised that the Redden didn't. Well, thank you again for having me, Luke Goblin. It's been a blast, and I look forward to our next endeavors of determining if DAD players are the a-holes. Well, it looks like that's all the stories we have for today. Make sure to like, subscribe, and share the video. And check out Twisted Pine Tavern, which I'm going to link down below for you guys to make it easy to find. Thanks for stopping by. We hope to see you in the next one. Farewell for now.